I think all my life, uh, since I remember, my my parents always told me that you have to become a doctor. Um, this is a thing in Pakistan. This is a culture actually. Uh, their parents have daughters and they have money for their education. They want them to become doctors because female doctors in Pakistan, they get the best hand in marriage and they're considered very noble and they have a higher social stature in the society. When I was doing medicine, I saw the same thing happening to 90% of my class. My 90% of my class was made up of females who were all there because of the same dream um, that we will become these noble creatures of society and get respected more. Meet Dr. Sarah Said, the co-founder and chief executive officer at Sehat Kahani. When I was when I was training, however, I realized that a lot of my peers and my friends, as soon as they started descending towards their education, so as soon as they started completing their years of education, medicine is five years in Pakistan. So from the fourth year, we saw that they started getting married and having children, which is which is when they were achieving their second dream was to get married into the best family and become the best homemaker because now they've become a doctor, now they got the best hand in marriage, they got the most eligible bachelor in town and now they became a wife or a mother. And I was very I was very disturbed by this um, by this equation. This inspired Sarah to build something very interesting and her story shows how technology and innovation can make a huge difference in achieving SGD3. We are now in the decade of action, and here we'll talk with companies and experts from all over the world about how they're taking actions on the SDGs. To learn from each other about the challenges, opportunities and solutions on the road towards 2030. From the GRI, this is The Rising Tide. Episode on STD 3, Good Health and Well-Being. When Sarah finished her five years of medical school, she found herself living her parents' dream. A married doctor ready to start a family. But she was adamant about getting a job and putting her medical expertise to work. Um, so I started working in um, a community clinic, where it was a clinic in a low-income community. They needed a doc, female doctor. I started working there. I started taking care of the entire project, the entire clinic. And I worked there, worked there all throughout my pregnancy. Um, and um, I, I left and I had to give birth to my baby. And I remember that this is um, six or seven years back. I was in this huge house with a new baby and my husband in a new city. And I completely broke down. Um, I realized that I had become this doctor bride, which is the term which is used for female doctors in Pakistan who don't work. Because I, I didn't know if I would ever work again because you know I had a baby to take after, I had a house to take after. Everyone expected me to just become a wife and a mother. Um, so no one really thought that okay, she also needs to work. So I went into severe postpartum depression. It was a very dark phase in my life uh, for three or four months. I didn't like my husband, I didn't like my baby, uh, I didn't like my house. In this dark and difficult time, a colleague from the past reached out. Just as I was battling that depression, um, the nurse that used to work with me in, in my clinic um, she started calling me and she said that, you know, we can't find a doctor to replace you because this is a low-income community. Low-income communities are relatively unsafe, uh, more politically polarized, more culturally polarized as well. So um, no female doctor was feeling safe enough to go into that community and working. So she said, then now what should I do? Patients keep coming in and I'm not able to handle them. So I said, okay, I'll see patients on call. So she used to call me whenever a patient comes in and I used to answer the call and it gave me something to do during my day. It gave me a sense of being somewhere seeing patients and it started working out well and later she called me one day and she said that you know patients complain of certain issues on their face and call doesn't solve it so then I asked her to get a small camera and she stuck it on her laptop and then started seeing patients on video. This coincidental return to medical practice from home sowed the seed and the idea started to grow and develop. And I, I, I was doing this and I, and I started talking about this to an ex-partner. And I said, this, see, I'm doing this. I'm feeling better as I'm seeing patients. And this is helping me come out of my depression. And he also said that, okay, this is good. And then he said, why don't you write a startup idea on it? That, you know, you are a female doctor sitting at home and providing consultations to patients. Why can't all female doctors who are stuck in this situation all over the world, they can do the same thing. And I somehow thought it was a great thing to do. But turning an idea into an actual startup, well, that's easier said than done. And I started working on the idea. Now, 
the the main idea was that a female doctor sitting at home will provide consultations to patients and power of communities using a telemedicine platform. I didn't have the female doctors. I didn't have the communities. I didn't have the platform. Um, so I had to find all three. Um, so the initial idea was that I'll find clinics in low income communities where nurses practice. They have their spaces, their practice. And then we convert them into telemedicine clinics. We train them for the software. We upgrade their space. So when a patient comes in, they're not seen by nurses or midwives. They're seen by actual doctors online. So determined to build on and upgrade the already existing clinics in low-income communities, Sarah set out to find the clinics, the female doctors, and the right platform. Meanwhile, everyone around doubted and questioned her. Even the family members thought it was a lingering symptom of her depression, when in reality, she was more energized than ever. To my city, I found the clinic uh, in a low-income community in Karachi, and it was given to me by a donor um, whose wife had passed away. And he said, "I want to make something in the name of my deceased wife, and I want to do something in healthcare for my community. But if it doesn't work, I'm going to take the space back from you in one year. So you have one year to try it. I don't care if you do telemedicine or you 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 know you do medicine through horses, but just do something for the community." He was a very kind gentleman. So we got the clinic. We hired a nurse there. We connected two doctors that joined me very initially, and we started doing services in the clinic. One thing that I did right was from day one, I kept the clinic paid, so the services were all charged. So I never wanted to start this from the idea of philanthropy or an NGO. I always wanted to make this a for-profit social enterprise. So we charged for the first patient that came into the room. We started doing consultations, and it worked. The company is called Sehat Kahani, and the honeymoon phase was filled with trial and errors, like any other startup. And by learning along the way and building back stronger with each setback, Sarah was soon ready to start thinking long term. But I think after a year, when we woke up from our honeymoon phase, we realized that if we had to run the company for the longer run, we need to find uh, a company that is financially sustainable. You know, the clinics made a lot of impact. They were in very high impact areas where people really needed healthcare. We felt very nice opening clinics all the time because, you know, it was instant connection between doctors and patients. But we had to make revenue in the company as well. Uh, and that is when we decided to add another vertical into the company, which was a high revenue, low impact vertical for the urban market. So up till now, we were creating clinics in low income communities for patients who didn't have access to smartphones. Now we started making a smartphone app for patients who had access to smartphones for them to independently connect to doctors as well. And when we launched the application, uh, it was December 2019. And, um, you know, we saw a very lukewarm response on the app because in Pakistan, people still don't, people still very much like physical doctors. The connection is very physical. Telemedicine was a very unheard term. People were ordering food online and ordering cabs, but having a doctor online wasn't a very mainstream thing. So we had to really pull people to the application. So we were doing you know, around 30, 40, 50 consults a day. And then we had around 40, 50 doctors who joined us. And it was just, you know, it was okay. It wasn't like, it, was banging, it wasn't banging out the roof anywhere. So does the phrase being at the right place at the right time sound familiar? Sarah and the team at Sehat Kahani launched the app right before the storm. And February 2020, COVID came in Pakistan. Now, when COVID came in Pakistan, suddenly physical doctors became a huge risk. The country went into a lockdown and everyone wanted to reach to doctors online. And I I got a call from the government one day. I think it was middle of March 2020. And they said that they wanted to partner with us. Um, to provide online telemedicine consultations to patients who are in lockdown and needed consultation from home. And I think that day and that moment, I think, is a very defining factor in Sehat Kahani's journey because we were we were we were targeting suddenly the whole of the country because governments has access everywhere. Overnight, you know, this and it was a very interesting situation in March because the clinics shut down. As in lockdown, we couldn't run the clinics. So the main driving factor of the company were the clinics at that time. You know, the majority of the team, our focus, everything was in the clinics. A smaller team ran the app. It was still in testing phase. So I think within 
24 hours, the entire company shifted focus from the clinics to the app. And we just regaled. Um, so we expanded our tech team in 15 days. We got a call center up and running. Uh, we recruited more doctors on the application because we're getting such a load on the application. And I think working with the government, um, it just added a lot to our credibility. We also launched another vertical of the app. So this is a retail vertical where individual consumers can reach out. But then we also re we also launched a corporate solution in which corporates can take their app take this app for their employees. And the employees don't pay for it, but the corporates pay on their behalf. And again, because of the lockdown, because corporates want to do something good for their employees, that model really picked up. Sehat Kahani's agile transition from clinics to the app and partnerships with governments and corporations paved the way for breaking down the cultural barriers for telemedicine and made it clear that it's a perfectly effective option for millions of people to meet their healthcare needs. I mean, the numbers really speak for themselves. Since March 2020, our growth has been around 357 percent. We had two corporate apps in March 2020. We have 753 corporates app now. Uh, 753 corporates using our application now. We used to see 60 patients on the app. Now we've uh, see, we've seen even more than 1,000 patients on the app a day. We've expanded our clinical network. So we were we are we are the largest telemedicine company in Pakistan. Uh, in terms of telemedicine clinics by any private company. We have 35 clinics across Pakistan, all across low-income areas, through all provinces. We have around 6,000 doctors in the network. Uh, we've raised a free series A round. We're the only female-led company in Pakistan who's done so. And we've doubled in our HR in the last one. What's also interesting about Sehat Kahani is that it's a win-win situation, improving the population's access to healthcare and supporting thousands of doctors in the same situation as Sarah was before, helping them put their medical degree into practice and get a purpose and mission outside the household. Also, I believe that when a female doctor comes back to work, it's not just an employment for her. It is a reason for her to bring back to her life. I have seen these female doctors giving more hours, being committed, being uh, empathetic towards patients, giving them time, um, being cost effective, being available. You know, we had a female doctor who delivered a baby and within 24 hours she was back on the app because she said my patients will miss me. When you think about it, we have an improvement in health and well-being for the doctors and the patients. In addition to that, telemedicine can solve the long-standing issue of access to good quality doctors in a cost-effective way. Someone from a faraway region no longer needs to afford the expenses of traveling to a big city for a consultation. All it takes is a device with an internet connection to make it happen. Patients in our part of the world hop between doctor to doctor carrying these huge case files in their hands. And their data is not stored anywhere. No one is taking accountability of their data uh, or their case history, which is why a lot of people just get lost during the way. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to reach out to. But when you have a place where your case history is being saved from one consultation to another, to another consultation, and you're coming back to the same space again, again, over, over time, that data becomes really powerful to be really helpful to the patient. You know, if I know that a diabetic patient is coming to my platform four or five times, I can predict when he would need his second visit, what kind of medicine change that he needs, what kind of lifestyle change would he require, when should be his next appointment. So that ability to do is very much possible now using technology and innovation, using AI algorithms, using machine learning. For a few years now, data has been labeled as the most valuable asset out there. And using it to build a single medical history and prevent patients from starting over and over again, this can be a powerful tool to achieve the goal of good health and well-being. So far, we've been talking about how a healthcare company can use tech and innovation in favor of achieving SDG3. But just as with all of the goals, this work can't be done in isolation and collaboration remains of uttermost importance. Let's meet Dr. Savanit Bunyasuvat. Vice President of Sustainability Strategy and Management at PTT Global Chemical. 
we starting to talk about sustainability about um, eight to ten years ago in PDT Global Chemicals when I am um, working for corporate planning and be talking about we're gonna turn CSR to something that quantifiable and create a value for our company. Be, um, besides, we always donations and everything is about paying the money. So we're gonna create value for that. In order to move CSR from philanthropy to something quantifiable and add value to the organization, Dr. Savanit and her team discovered that access to quality healthcare professionals was a common pain point for the communities in the Rayong province where the company is located. So they decided to work on the issue right away. We have this clinic which has been established in uh, two of our plants in, in Rayong and both, both clinics provide uh, expert treatment for people in the nearby community for free. We're listening to Pom Polachan, Corporate Social Responsibility Officer at PTT Global Chemical. And also we collaborated with the Thai Red Cross Society in Rayong to provide older persons and persons with disabilities of low income with eye surgery operation for free of charge uh, is done since uh, 2019. And with this mobile eye surgery unit, uh, we have uh, operated more than 600 patients in Rayong. These programs gave healthcare access to people in low-income communities and reached vulnerable groups. But the Ministry of Public Health was also warning that the country was suffering from a shortage of qualified medical personnel, especially in low-income and remote areas. And lastly, we also granted a full scholarship for 440 nursing students in Rayong with strong academic performance from low-income families. And once they graduated, these students would take up positions in hospital in Rayong. And this is done to minimize the, to- the shortage of qualified medical personnel. Directly addressing a societal challenge and during the COVID-19 pandemic, when equipment like masks and face shields used by doctors and nurses all over the world were scarce and hard to find. The company decided to leverage their strengths and partnerships to open a new business vertical, which was all about manufacturing medical equipment. By innovating and using 3D printing and reusable materials, they dispatched millions of products all over the country to meet the needs in the wake of the crisis. The the medical strategy, as our executive construct, the first one is we learn the pain points because we are new on the area of the medical we learn the pain point. Our CEO, our executive go to the uh, medical school and talking what kind of thing that you need, what is have to be secure our countries, and they found out what is the pain point. And after that, we decide that we're going to use um, our resource, our innovations to help people. You know, we have the protective um, equipment and everything, the negative pressure um um, box and everything that we do in the alcohol and everything about the chemicals to help secure the medical the medical supply for our countries that we use the the um the innovations and our resources and our um, knowledge to help people in in our countries and the last thing on the on the third strategy it's about the partnership it's very important we are very new and sustainability cannot do it alone we have to have the partners then partner along value chains and supply chains very important. Now we use our partner to help our nation to secure the medical supplies. And now there is success on that. I can say that this is a very success story that Kun Pum already tell you that the coverage of the healthcare or medical and spread out our countries. There's about 77 provinces in all over area of the, in, in our country in Thailand. There are construct of the three strategy very easy. We learn the pain points. The second thing we use innovation and our resources. And then the third one is the partnership. The example of PTT Global Chemicals show how good health and well-being can be promoted from various angles, from the actual medical services to innovative business models in support of the healthcare system. The beauty of all of this is that it's not just about tech solutions or new ways of doing business. It's about all of us addressing the same challenge from different perspectives, covering all of the blind spots. Before we close out, we asked Sarah what kind of actions are needed in the coming decade to achieve SGD3. And this is what she had to say. I think the first thing that we need to do is 
the, for the governments to realize that digital healthcare is the next and most convenient, affordable form of healthcare and really invest in the policy. Um, so many countries who need telemedicine don't have a policy. Even Pakistan did not have a policy since till early this year, but now we have one basic form of policy that's being upgraded. Um, the second thing that I want to I want to comment on here is a lot of in countries like Pakistan, health is supposed to be a public health care system where it should be given in government hospitals, in government dispensaries. Because we don't have manpower there, patients go to private health care. Now, why don't we have a manpower in government clinics or government hospitals is because we don't have doctors. Um, so they end up not going in government hospitals as well. So I think, again, digital health care can be a great alternative. So the government needs to adopt it. The government needs to public-private partnerships and have more people using solutions that are built by private providers, um, give them space to pilot, give them space to fail, and then fix their solution and then scale it. Because when a lot of people start using it at public healthcare systems, that is when people will start getting used to it. That is when the trust is going to build. That is when the convenience and the replicability is going to come. Once you have convenience and replicability, once you have a critical mass of people using these solutions, then you can create more complicated, complex systems on it. Then you can actually connect it with wearables, connect it with tertiary care hospitals, connect it with devices, really make patient data travel from one place to another, make sure you're doing preventive healthcare messaging. Everything is possible once you have this the base right where a lot of people are using it. Um, so if I had to do something in the next 10 years, I would really, really, really suggest governments create a clear telemedicine policy and framework, work with private providers to implement these solutions at government level, develop a critical mass, put funding behind it because nothing happens without money, put funding behind it, behind private providers to scale their solutions and really create that ecosystem in which a lot of different providers can come up, reach a critical mass and then build on to complex solutions from there. The takeaway here is that partnerships, innovation and digitalization of the healthcare systems of the world are going to have a defining role on whether we achieve SDG 3 by 2030 or not, and even more so after the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic. But to do so, the first step is being open-minded about the new ways in which healthcare needs can be met. From establishing healthcare facilities and addressing shortage of healthcare professionals in new and innovative ways, we've seen here that business can play a fundamental role in achieving good health and well-being that leaves no one behind. The Rising Tide podcast is co-produced by the GRI and Nahanha Media. We want to thank Dr. Sarah Said, Dr. Savanid Bunyasovat and Pumpulachan for the sharing their time and expertise. We also want to thank the Swedish government for making this podcast series possible. We greatly appreciate their long-standing support for sustainable development work, catalyzing action towards the SDGs. My name is Tina Nybo Jensen. Thank you for listening. <laughs>